Welcome to the Vision for Life podcast, an ongoing conversation between the pastors of Fellowship Denver and the church at large. Each week we talk about life, faith, the Bible, and how to follow Jesus as we go about our daily lives. I'm Autumn, the host of the podcast, and today I have a couple of guests joining me. Hunter, who's a regular guest on the podcast. Hunter, I'm glad you're here with me. And then our friend Jeff Kazir is also joining us on the podcast today. Jeff, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're so glad you're spending some time with us today. And this podcast conversation is one in a series in which we're talking about the idea of faithful presence in a particular aspect of work. And I was contemplating as I was putting together this series how long I could make it. It's going to ultimately be five conversations. But I really wanted to focus on different sectors of the marketplace and the perspective for a Christian presence, an integrated faith and work perspective in different aspects of the marketplace. And I thought you were the perfect guest because you can tell us about five different sectors <laughs> right. of the yeah. marketplace. So we're just going to cover a lot of ground in one episode today. <laughs> Jeff is one of the most interesting people you'll meet because <laughs> he has what our friend Jill Anschutz calls a portfolio career, which means that Jeff has a folder, a portfolio, and in that portfolio, he has four or five jobs that he does, including a craft fair. That is true. That's the not one. your main money maker. That's the uh, that's the bell cow of the whole thing. That's the, the prize money. <laughs> but you do own a craft fair, and my mom was super into crafts in the '90s, so I feel like I know what these craft fairs entail. Yeah, and. I lost just a tiny bit of respect for you when, when I found out that you bought a craft fair. Well, if your mom's ever in town in the in the uh, in the fall, tell her to come up to Boulder County. We'll we'll get her in, and she'll be pleasantly surprised. My mom would make woodcuts and paint them, you know, with with things, and then she started teaching other people to do it. And then our house filled up with like wood things that had been cut and painted. So this was part of my traumatic childhood, and. Um, you're perpetuating that. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I think that was a really liberal use of the word traumatic, but well, you we, know, we'll just keep moving forward. We've talked about that, <laughs> that on the was, podcast yeah. in, in the past. Jeff, can you introduce yourself? <laughs> sure, just yeah. let us know that a little bit about you. That was a great introduction. You. I'm also, he's proud and he's also, I'm a, uh, traumatizing him. So, uh, yeah, my name is Jeff and, uh, I'm a Colorado native through and through. I grew up in a small farm town about 60 miles north of Denver called Eaton, Colorado. Grew up on a farm there. And um, yeah, it was a good upbringing. I uh, have two sisters and my parents still all live in the in the small town. So uh, kind of the quintessential small American farm town. Uh, moved to Denver about 20 years ago to attend Colorado Christian University. Uh, I studied business there and just haven't left the city since. So um, after college, Kind of hopped around a few jobs, which is not surprising, knowing that's just my career track. But I uh, was in higher education for a little bit. I uh, was in the music industry as a tour manager for a band for a bit. I uh, was in the restaurant industry as a server. And uh, kind of in the meantime, was going back to school um, to get my MBA. And after finished that, um, the owner, uh, the, the owner then of Terracotta, uh, the restaurant I own, I uh, said, hey, you should think about getting into real estate. And so that was kind of the, the journey into real estate and then also entrepreneurship and along the way just kind of picking up businesses, including the craft fair, um, over the last 10 years. So, mm. yeah. And you're also a part of Fellowship Denver, I am. as is your family. Yep. So can you tell us a bit yeah. about your family? Yeah, so um, my wife Megan and I have been going to Fellowship for about 11 years. Um, when we were dating and engaged, we were both we were going to different churches. I was going to another Acts 29 church, and she was going to a church down south. And we just kind of made the decision, like, hey, we want to um, just find a, a, a faith community together, um, kind of form new friendships together. Um, and so I kind of knew I wanted to be a Acts 29 church, and uh, we were living in City Park at the time. And so fellowship just made a whole lot of sense uh, practically, and we just started going and fell in love with it. And um, yeah, I've been going ever since. So that's really our strategy is to, uh, first of all, get you with our practicality <laughs> and, and then eventually cause you to fall in love. It's a good dating yeah, philosophy yeah, too. It's, yeah. it's worked well for yep, me. Yep. Hand the girl your resume first. And it's like, Hey, this makes sense on paper. And then really woo her on the first couple of dates. I'm a very practical common <laughs> sense, man. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, Jeff, we've been asking our guests in this series, and I would love to hear you share too. What is your faith heritage? Yeah. Um, so I grew up in the church. Uh, my parents were were heavily involved in our in our small town church, and so kind of that was just a rhythm. Um, growing up was just every Sunday. It was kind of the the thing we did, um, and so I feel like. I accepted the Lord probably as my savior and kind of understood that at a pretty young age, like five or six, it started making sense and, and really have just kind of had this slow kind of, you know, stumbling sometimes ups and downs of, you know, sanctification, just kind of stumbling forward in it for the last 35 years. So mm-hmm. I always tell my, my, my testimony is so boring compared to my wife's where she kind of had this, this life of hedonism during college and after, and, and then her mom took her on a trip to Israel and she was literally standing at where they said the tomb of Jesus was and like had this vision of Jesus and said, that's the answer to life and became a believer right there. So she had this total like conversion story. Mine's just been like this messy sanctification for, for three and a half decades. So, mm-hmm. yeah. But it's always been a part of my life and, and obviously just in our marriage and how we raise our kids. It's, um, it's a, you know, of the utmost importance for us. So, Okay. You mentioned all of this a moment ago, but I want to clarify for the sake of the rest of our conversation, yep. your current work yep. is you own a craft fair, which Hunter already <laughs> mentioned. Yes, you yes. own a restaurant that you alluded to, yep. Terracotta yep. in Littleton, yep. and you are in real estate. That's right. Yeah. So uh, of those kind of have been a real estate agent the longest. So I've had my license for about 11 years now. Um, and then just just over the course of the last few years, um, you know, just kind of wanted to dabble a little more in um, different business ventures. And I'm an Enneagram 7. So like the next thing always sounds like the right thing and, and more is always is always better. And so I'm like, sure, let's buy a restaurant. Sure, let's buy a craft fair. And, and so my job is kind of morphed to from being a real estate agent to now I kind of say, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I like just, yeah, dabbling in different things and kind of having a, a nice variety or a portfolio career. Now, what I know about you is you do like the variety, and there is a certain aspect of just how you're wired and how God made you that you're able to juggle a lot of things, have your hands in different things. You're also really intentional, though. I I know you. (laughs) You're very thoughtful about what you do with your time. You're very intentional about how you uh, spend your, your energy, your resources, and there's stories about you having giant whiteboards at home where you map out like a year you and Megan map out years at a time yes. so there's there's a little bit of strategy and a lot of thoughtfulness and prayer behind the what appears to be a guy who's just doing dabbling or doing a lot of different things sure. you're not dabbling in anything but doing a lot of sure. different things so describe what the intentionality looks like for someone who has a lot of things going on yeah I think for a long time I thought the goal was was freedom or was autonomy like hey I just want to find a job where I can make enough money kind of do whatever I want when I want because uh, again that's kind of my personality is like always on the go always doing different things and I quickly realized like that is not where I flourish um, that I really am better when I kind of have structure and even if it's self-imposed structure. And so, um, just kind of early on in our marriage, Megan and I talked through this and just realized, Hey, we need, we need good boundaries. We need good structure. We need intentionality or I will be left to my own devices. I'll just, you know, just sit there and procrastinate and dream about big things without actually doing anything. So I think I need, I'm very goal oriented and need those things, not because that's how I'm naturally bent, but because I've realized to be, successful in a professional, um, sense, but just intentional with my time, with my community, with my family and friends and church, I have to have kind of some, some pretty strong structure. I love this about your story because you have learned things that aren't in your personality quote, or they don't quote come naturally. And yet they are skills you've acquired and disciplined yourself with that actually help what does come naturally to to be stewarded and channeled and focused in a good life giving direction, which I think is just what a lot of what Christian sanctification looks like. It, it's taking sometimes it's working with your natural personality, but not just giving full expression to it, but but letting other things that don't come intuitively uh, speak into that, shape shape that, hone that, and you do that really well. An aspect of this intentionality, too, is what I think we can actually see you live out now, and that's the integration of faith and work that has grown into your story as well. And so how did that process look for you? Yeah, so 
<clears throat> like I mentioned, I started I started real estate about 11 years ago, and it really was birthed out of a conversation where I just finished grad school, just got married. I was waiting tables. Uh, Megan was uh, she's a registered dietitian, and she was fully gainfully employed at the point. And I think even after a couple months, was getting a little. Uh, leery of her, her husband that was, you know, hanging out in his pajamas till noon, and then would go to work and be home late because I was a, a waiter. And, and so that's when it was approached with the real estate idea. And so at first, it was really a, um, hey, I need a job, I need to be gainfully employed and pr- providing. And where because I've, you know, faith has always been a part of my life. It was, it was integrated, but not in the way of like, this is why I'm going to go do this. I I went to become a real estate agent because I thought, Hey, I think I could be good at this. I know that you can make money doing this. And it still lent me some flexibility in my schedule, not necessarily this, you know, nine to five, you have to wear a a shirt and tie to work. So it started as kind of, yes, my faith is integrated in the way I work, but not exactly why I chose that profession right then. Um, and the same thing with, with the restaurant and with the craft fair, they kind of, so there was a period where, um, so we got, Megan and I got married a little later. So we had, we started having kids pretty quickly after we got married. So we had two young kids. I was already selling real estate and pretty busy because the market was picking up, got approached to buy part of the restaurant. So that, so it was just kind of like things were moving really, really fast. And so again, the way I operated, I think my faith was integrated, but not purposely making decisions of this is our next career step because of my faith. Mm. I think that shift happened probably about probably three or four years ago um, when the dust kind of started to settle with just our, our family. We were done having kids. They were getting a little older, out of diapers, things like that. And and the different segments of my career were, were going were going well. And so I had the the luxury to stop, take inventory and really kind of start thinking about, okay, don't just be reactionary in your next move, try to map out, be intentional. And a lot of it came from um, a guy's group at Hunter's house uh, on Wednesday mornings at 6am. And he just had us go through this exercise of just kind of um, casting a vision for our own lives and writing down, you know, where we see the cultural mandate and the Great Commission kind of coming to, you know, an intersection in our lives and our vocation. And so um, what a, what a gift, what a tool that was for me to be able to, to say, all right, here's what I want to do with the next step, the next several steps. So, um, so I'd say that was the point where really faith and, and, and work integrated fully, mm-hmm. not just the way I do business. Mm-hmm. So. And it sounds like you developed this mindset of stewarding what God had already given yep. you to a different maybe end or with yep. a different vision. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's again, not my normal bent, but that's what I'm trying to do now of rather than thinking of what's the next thing, thinking about what has God given me right now and focusing on those things. So rather than thinking about, um, you know, what a next business could be being like, okay, these are the businesses that you currently own. Are you stewarding those? Well, this is your wife and kids. Are you stewarding, you know, are you, are you loving them? Well, Mm -hmm. this is your church community. These are your close friends. Are you doing well with the things that that God's put before you right now versus daydreaming about what could be the next thing. So I like that you caught yourself right there. <laughs> stewarding my <laughs> Yeah. Megan wants to be loved, not stewarding. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Am I getting the most I mean, out of my wife aspect. and kids that I could? There's an aspect of right. that. Most certainly. But right. yes, <laughs> maybe, maybe a different term. And when I say what is the, what the next thing could be, I do not mean wife and kids on that either. <laughs> I only, yeah. Um, Jeff, I wonder if we could shift our conversation a bit into discussing the different arenas of work that you move and operate in and helping our listeners get a handle on those a little bit. And then on your perspective, you can offer some perspective on those different realms. So in these conversations that we've been having, this is the third that will air. And so I've spoken with uh, Jill and Hannah Skindera on the topic of education. And they both shared this sense of motivation that they have in their work. The compulsion they have towards this kind of work is because they they both see this huge impact that educational systems have on individuals and on our society. And they're drawn to do the kind of work they do because of this common desire to help children thrive and grow into mature adults who can navigate life and navigate our society. And then Alex, who spoke on Alex Harris, joined us and spoke about his work as an attorney and his pro- progression 
of growth in his career path, what God has led him into and how he is stewarding that. But ultimately where he has landed is that he is a trial lawyer and he wants to engage the law and his clients and his partners with integrity so that he can support his family well and pursue his work in a way that allows him to live and work out this vocational understanding of calling in his life. And I think both of those are beautiful and visionary and I appreciate that they shared those those things. So you've offered a little bit of insight into what motivated you <laughs> initially into this area of real estate. And I think that there's probably some commonality in what does compel certain people or types of people towards certain sorts of work. So my question is a bit of simplification, but I wonder if you would share a little bit of your personal motivations and maybe how those are being changed and shaped now, and then what you see as an attractive element towards this area of the real, the real estate industry. Yeah. I have to be honest, I was a little nervous when I saw that I was following up Mr. Harris. Uh, that's kind of tough billing there. But um, yeah, so I think the early motivation, especially with real estate, was I need to get an actual job and provide for my wife and hopefully, you know, the children that come along. And real estate seemed like, um, you know, a good avenue for that. Um, I had, I had just finished grad school and had an MBA and I interviewed for a couple jobs and it just really came back to a little bit of that autonomy freedom piece where I didn't want to go, um, sit in a cubicle. And so, um, like I mentioned, so my, my restaurant business partner is also my real estate business partner. Okay. And, and so, um, at the restaurant, he was obviously owning it and I was waiting tables and he just kind of talked to me about, you know, he had three young kids at the time and talked to me about pros and cons and, um, and really, you know, convinced me that, it, that it was a good path to take. And so again, it was kind of a practical move to start just like joining fellowship Denver. Um, just the practicality of it made sense. And then really from there, I did kind of fall in love with the, with the industry. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's a really fun, exciting, um, job. I get to work with people and, and the way I kind of view my job now is I get to be, um, kind of their, their, their Sherpa through one of the most stressful, uh, transactions of, of a lot of people's lives of, of buying or selling a house. And so I enjoy that. I kind of, I like taking on, um, other people's stress and helping them kind of feel at ease going through what can be kind of a tumultuous, um, transaction. Hopefully not. Mm -hmm. Jesse can maybe attest to it. So, um, <laughs> And then, Jesse's always here with us. What's that? Jesse's always yes, here with that's us. Right. That's right. He's the unspoken but very Sorry. important partner <laughs> added in, the, all production of, crew there. <laughs> in all of our podcast conversations. <laughs> um, and then with 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 real estate, I think, and and so I guess what what what's the commonality between be, be, between people that that start becoming a real estate agent? I think it's it, those things. I think it's the flexibility mm -hmm. of of your schedule. I think it's the you know kind of fast paced nature of the job. I mean, you're, you're wheeling and dealing and showing a house, running back to your office and writing an offer. And so there is some excitement to it and things look different week to week. And, but I think the overarching reason that most people get into to real estate is just the, the people aspect. I mean, mm -hmm. um, having and serving clients is, is a joy and, and it should be for all real estate agents. And I, I know that that's why a lot of people get into it. So it's also a hard industry to get going in. I've had several friends in real estate. Some have done really well in it as you have and some have struggled to get going in it so talk a little bit about what makes real estate hard to get going in i think it's hard to get going because there is a huge um trust act aspect to it of um again it's a it's the biggest financial transaction that most you know people make in their lives. And so you want a trusted advisor in that. And so it's hard to get that trust with people without having that pedigree or that background in it. So, um, convincing, convincing clients at a, when you're just starting out that you're able to handle their finances, um, adequately is, mm -hmm. is a tough task. So, I mean, it was a little older when I started, but you do see a lot of young agents start in their early twenties and, um, it's just, it's a, it's a tall task to get people to say, yeah, I'll, I'll sign up with you. So, um, I think that's an aspect and honestly the ebbs and flows of the market. I mean, um, 
you know, I think they said last summer there was more real estate agents than listings on the on the MLS in Denver. And so um, there's just a lot of competition out there. So. So it's an interesting industry to me in that on the one hand, there's a low barrier to entry, mm-hmm. meaning the training, the certification you have to go through to be a realtor. There is something there, but it's not as significant as what you would need to be an attorney who's practicing law, for example. The education requirements, all that are, are lower. And, and so it's something that a lot of people can try. And yet the skill set that it takes to really be successful and the discipline it takes to really be successful lends itself toward a lot of people who have a real estate license may or may not be able to make a sustainable career out of it. So I think as people are asking, what what kind of work should I pursue? Mm-hmm. It's just interesting to think about the kind of work that is low barrier to entry. Mm-hmm. Sales jobs might be the same way, mm-hmm. low barrier mm-hmm. to entry, but also a low level of success in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's totally true of why a lot of people get into it. Cause I do see, um, cause you can, I mean, you can make a great living selling real estate similar to an attorney or a doctor, but the, the entrance barrier is so far lower than that. You have to, you know, go to a, go to a real estate school and study for a few months and take a couple of tests and, um, get your license. And so there's not, it's not nearly what obviously med school or law school or things like that. So I think people get real excited, like, Oh, I could, I could go get my license and, and sell a couple of houses. And I've seen statistics of like what the number, what the average is of like how many homes a re- your normal real estate agent sells a year. And it's like less than one or 1. 1.5 or something like mm-hmm. that. So um, a lot of them are just people that like, it sounds like a good idea and they, they go through it. And then at the end, like you said, they don't have the kind of consistent discipline or, um, or sphere. I mean, that, that was a big part of it too. I mean, just growing up in Colorado and going to college in Colorado and being here for, you know, at that point, 30 years, like I had a pretty good built-in network. Um, and that's very helpful, but there's people that don't have that kind of, kind of built-in safety net, I guess. On the other hand, some of the careers that have a higher barrier to entry, we mentioned law, we mentioned Mm -hmm. medicine, accounting, which I worked in is the same way. They have a high barrier to entry in that you have to complete quite a bit of education and then a certification process to practice in those professions. There's also a pretty big safety net there, uh, meaning even the basic doctor who didn't kill it at med school and didn't graduate top of their class, but who did make it through med school and made it through residency is going to probably have a pretty sustainable career. Mm -hmm without being a high achiever in their field, real estate has a lower barrier to entry. A lot of people can try it, and and yet not a lot of people can make it sustainable. So I just think this is interesting as a lot of our listeners are thinking about their career, their work, what kinds of work to pursue. Mm-hmm. It's just interesting to note these differences in, mm-hmm. in lines of work. Hmm. I have a question back in that regard, Hunter, to you, and then Jeff, if you, looking back over your career path so far, have something to add, I would welcome your feedback too, but in developing this kind of broad understanding of vocation and the theological underpinnings for it, you're saying, Hunter, if someone is imagining what to do or what to do next or what path to pursue, perhaps this understanding, having a a broad vision of work and calling and seeing whatever work you choose to do as a part of your vocation helps, I think, within that conversation. So can you speak to that for a moment, just that process of discernment and a perspective that enables us to navigate those kinds of questions? Well, you're talking about discerning what kind of work the Lord has gifted you and called you to do. And that's a, a, a big uh, process for a lot of people. And it takes a lot of prayer, it takes a lot of feedback, it takes some trial and error. And I think it's just interesting to note some things are easier to try than other things are easier to try. (laughs) So it's a different commitment to say, I'm going to try real estate, or I'm trying to think of another example of something that has a pretty low barrier entry, a sales job, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try that. Being a children's minister, like getting a job at a church as a children's director. There's lots of jobs available. I get posts about them every week. (laughs) They'd probably hire you if you're listening. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay. Versus something you're going to have to go to school for years in order to pursue. I think I think it's important when you're asking about something you're going to have to go to school for years to pursue to ask, do I want to give myself to the discipline of years and years of education? 
for someone who's going into an industry like real estate, you have to ask yourself, am I willing to embrace the risk that comes with this? Because there's not a, a guarantee, so to speak, of a, a sustainable, well-paying career for everyone who goes into real estate. Whereas, to my earlier point, if you complete the course of education that it requires to become an attorney, you can you probably have a marketable skill some attorneys graduate top of their class, some attorneys graduate middle, some graduate lower, some graduate from prestigious law schools, some graduate from very middle of the road law schools. And that's all going to affect kind of what kind of work you're going to be able to do, but it's not going to probably affect if you're going to be able to make a living as an attorney. If mm-hmm. you, if you commit to the process, you will, you will be able to. So I just think this is these are interesting trade-offs. I see the same thing with pastors trying to plant churches. Church planting is, in a lot of ways, a very low barrier to entry field. I wish the barriers to entry were higher, but there's not a lot of big certification processes for planting churches. A lot of pastors probably get approved by whatever sending organization or church they're working with to go plant a church who are not going to, it's not, the church is not going to be sustainable. So it's, it's low barrier to entry and pretty high failure rate, or if we don't want to use the term failure, which I, that could be too strong of a word, there are a lot of pastors who plant churches who it's not going to be sustainable for them or for the church for for a long haul. That's part of the reality of this. There's just, you have to ask, are you willing to embrace that risk when you, when you go into it? it? It doesn't have a guaranteed safety net. And as in many stories, like Jeff, yours that you're sharing with us today, this understanding of calling and vocation develops as you're in a given career path. It is possible to have these theological understandings when you're headed into this decision-making process, but more often, I think it grows up in the process of maturing in a job and learning through it. And we see how God uses that job as a tool of spiritual formation in our lives. Um, All right, I'm going to hard shift us back. Thanks, Hunter. That's really helpful into talking about this particular sector of the marketplace. And I'm wondering, Jeff, first we'll take real estate, but I'd also like to ask you about the service industry. What trends are shaping the real estate market right now? Yeah, um, I'd say the biggest trends in, I mean, nationwide, the biggest trend obviously is interest rates. Um, That is a huge, just a, a huge impact on the market um in denver uh over the last three years we've just seen you know prices skyrocket and inventory drop and so um it's just it's a fascinating time in the real estate market um and it makes it exciting but it also makes it pretty challenging so i think those are kind of the macro trends of of the real estate market right now Hmm. how about that second question that i mentioned the service industry similarly could you comment on trends shaping the service industry yeah, I mean, like, you, you couldn't name an industry that hasn't been, you know, rocked in the last two and a half years. Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like, obviously, with a global pandemic, everything has shifted and changed. I think uh, the restaurant industry, obviously, was um, largely impacted by by a pandemic in the fact that we had to close our doors. And so um, you're seeing a lot of shift as over the last year, year and a half of opening back up, just... Um, different styles um, of, you know, restaurants popping up or different um, operational models or, you know, unfortunately, a lot of restaurants have had to just close their doors permanently. They couldn't ride out the storm. Um, so in that, I think you're seeing you're seeing a couple shifts. One is this. I feel like a little bit the 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 middle part of the restaurant industry is getting, you know, weeded out um, where you're going to either you know, big corporate chains that are kind of taking over the market or even farther, smaller, independent, um, kind of one-off um, neighborhood restaurants. And so um, what, people are going one of the two ways of either we're going to be really specialized and this is, you know, we are going to be the the Asian fusion place in this little neighborhood pocket of, of Denver or we are going to be, you know, the Chipotle's of the world and just continuing to grow and grow and grow. Um and with, with the Chipotle's or with these these larger corporations, I see a big trend in just everything being automated and really trying to take out a, a personal piece of the, a personal touch piece of the restaurant industry. So, um, yeah, I think that's kind of a, a major trend right now. 
talk about where your restaurant, Cafe Terracotta, sits in the landscape of restaurants. We're, we're, your, you're, we're your typical Chipotle type restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Just thousands of stores. And, yeah. Which means if I go, when I go to Chipotle, because of the way takeout has changed everything, yeah. I, there can be no one in Chipotle and I can still sit there and look at the beans and the rice for five minutes while they make all the takeout orders you know i was just talking to megan about this this morning of like trends and 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 what my presence can be and how my faith can be integrated and i i mentioned that i said i am tired of restaurants prioritizing the online order versus the actual human being that's standing right in front of them Mm -hmm. i don't i just i don't like that so hospitality is something you're passionate about so your restaurant is a local restaurant yep it sits in the space if you want to offer a a hospitality experience. Yep. Now, I'm assuming you do take out as well. We do, but it's it's really small and um, just our our, re- our our location. So it's a restaurant, it's Cafe Terracotta. It's in, um, like in Old Town, downtown Littleton, and it's in an old Victorian house. We have 15 tables inside and about 15 tables outside in our garden area. Um, and so it really is the... Um, kind of whole package of the hospitality of, you know, we pride ourselves on having a really cool space, exposed brick and hardwood floors in a, you know, a house that was built in, I think, 1906. And we have really good servers. And so it is kind of this, it's it's less of a transactional, I'm hungry, I need something to eat. It's more of a, hey, it's a special occasion, let's go out and celebrate. And so um, I love that aspect of it. I love that it's more of an experience. I love that it's more of um, a night out versus just, you know, a means to an ends of I need a hamburger. Um, but yeah, there, there, there are challenges to that. So I, anyway, I would say that we are on the, we are obviously on the spectrum of the small independent little shop. And not yeah. Your, your comment earlier restaurant. about being a Chipotle style restaurant was sarcastic. It was sometimes sarcastic. Sometimes doesn't sorry. read well on yeah, the podcast, yeah. which sometimes I have to uh, come back and remind Hunter of as well. <laughs> you have a, you have a vision of hospitality that comes out of your faith. Though, I do that informs how you lead your restaurant, how you lead your team. Yeah, yeah. I think I mean all through. I think all through Scripture. I mean, there's a huge hospitality aspect and, and a huge piece around around the table, around breaking bread together, around community, um, having a meal together. And so there is definitely an integration of my faith in in that piece, and. Um, yeah, it makes me very, I mean, even before we owned the restaurant, Megan and I always dreamed of that, of having something in the, in the food and beverage industry, just because we love to cook, we love to eat, we love to have, I mean, one of my favorite things is just have friends around the table and just sitting there telling stories and having good food. And so um, it's fun that one of my entrepreneurial avenues has to line up with with a passion and I feel like a, a, a calling and a spiritual gifting. So, hmm. Jeff, your personal presence in your different avenues of work looks a little bit different. So in your real estate profession, you are an owner and you interact with clients sometimes, but you also work with some other real estate agents who I believe work for you. So could you describe and maybe uh, compare or contrast your different roles in that industry versus as a restaurateur and as an entrepreneur in that way, you're overseeing a staff of people. And so you're present with them in a different way, in probably a leadership or managerial way that isn't quite the same as in your real estate business. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. For real estate, um, I mean, we do have a team. We have, you know, other guys in the office, but it's most, for the most part, I'm working, you know, for myself and by myself and, and really the, the, the relationships are, you know, with my clients. Um, and then with, with the restaurant, it is, we have about a team of 35 to 40 people. And so it is a lot more of the, the leadership and, you know, kind of team aspect and working together, um, to accomplish the goal versus just, Hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in a coffee shop on a laptop and I'm working, um, it's, you're in a, in a busy restaurant and working side by side with people. So I appreciate the, the, the change up. I like going from one to the other. Sometimes I do need just a minute to, to kind of, you know, go to a coffee shop and work by myself. Um, but I, I obviously being kind of a, an extroverted person, I love being in the restaurant and working with a team and, and being able to pour into a staff, um, and, and lead people. So. Mm-hmm. I imagine that your personal presence there is very shaping for not only the atmosphere of the restaurant and 
weaving in your perspective on hospitality, but then also in the ways that you're able to actually interact with the people who are on the staff at the restaurant. And so do you have any any maybe anecdotes or thoughts to share about that, about the opportunity present when you're in a space like that in which you have an actual leadership role via your title, but then also you have the opportunity to provide a certain, to develop really and shape a certain atmosphere or environment via the way that you're present with people. Yeah, I think um, kind of thinking through my staff at the restaurant, it's really kind of broken out into three pretty, pretty clearly defined groups of people and not to over characterize everyone that works there. But, um, so one group is just your typical younger, ho- uh, um, hospitality industry, uh, workers. So college kids that just need a job busting tables on the weekend, or, you know, someone that's maybe in between college and their first job and want to wait tables. So that's kind of, that's kind of one, um, sector. Another one is being a higher end restaurant. I mean, we do have several of our waiters are, you know, late or mid to late thirties or even older than that. They are decided, I love the hospitality industry. I want to be a career server or, um, a chef or, you know, this is, this is my plan. This isn't a, a transition from one thing to the next. Um, so you have that sector. And then the third is, um, like a lot of restaurants, especially in Denver and in the West, we have a lot of, um, uh, workers from, from Mexico and from Central America and, and they're here and, and they're working one, two, three, four jobs. And, and so we kind of have these clear sectors and I feel like my presence and my leadership kind of gets the ability and the privilege to kind of speak into each one differently. Mm-hmm. So they're young kids. We have a lot of sharp high school and college kids that again, are just, they're needing a, a summer job or a part-time job. And it, it's fun to, um, just see them and, and, and coach them to, Hey, I know that this is a part-time job. I know that you're not thinking you're going to be a waiter or a cook 20 years from now, or when you're done with college, but teaching them the the value of just working hard, no matter what that job is. And just the value of, um, yeah, being part of a, being part of a larger team and, and taking pride in your work, whether it's busting tables or filling up waters. So that part's fun. It's kind of the career hospitality industry people, um, just with this change in my own, vocational journey over the last four years of being able to step back a little bit and, and see bigger picture. It's fun. And it's not for everyone. Some are like, Hey, I am happy as a clam, just serving, making my money, going home, skiing a couple days a week and living that life. But, but for the people that haven't maybe thought about a career change or just helping kind of do a little coaching of uh, kind of career coaching, um, on the fly with them. So that part's fun. And then the third category of just, um, you know, the, the immigrants from other countries, like just loving on them. And I, I can't tell you how, what a, what an amazing testament it is to, um, to those cultures, how hard they work, mm-hmm. how kind they are, how much they appreciate just family. Like one had a quinceanera for her, his, her, the pair, both the parents work at the restaurant and her, their daughter had a quinceanera. They invited everyone there after sh- shift, the whole staff went, one got married and everyone was there and just this, their idea and their, their vision of family is really, really cool. So I just, I love, I love learning from them and just being able to interact with them day to day is so much fun. In American history with every immigrant community, there's often been a multi-generational perspective. The first generation that comes is often sees themselves self-consciously. They are creating a pathway for their family that's going to follow them, their mm-hmm. children and the family that's going to follow them. Do you see that? Totally. So one of my, one of our top employees um, has worked there since we opened in 2006. He started as a dishwasher. He's now our kitchen manager. Um, and so his wife and his daughter who had the quince, you know, she works there as mm-hmm. well. And just how hard they work and, you know, and she's going to school and, and she's applying for colleges and it's just starting that path. And they're instilling hard work in here and those, you know, fundamental, like, um, that work ethic, but also saying we're, we're setting you up for the next step. Like you were going to go to college and do these Mm -hmm. bigger things. And so, um, I just love that, that picture of, of family and, and again, how many risks they took to, to get here and how hard they work to just, to be here, just to provide a better life for their kids and and what they're going to do with it. And, um, Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Jeff, you've been on both ends of this this deal, <laughs> this yeah. restaurant business. Yeah. You said you started as a waiter, yeah. and now you're an owner at the same restaurant. At the same restaurant. Yeah. At the same restaurant, yeah. and have the op- and you were invested in yeah. by the person who's now yep. your business partner. And so Hunter made the point earlier that a lot of people in our congregation probably have had experience in the service industry in some way. From your vantage point now, how would you encourage someone who maybe is young? or is going to school and is picking up a couple shifts a week at a restaurant or in retail to make ends meet or to bring in a little extra income in the season of life that they're in right now, what kind of vision could you give them for the way that their presence can still be really important in the place that God has them in the moment? Yeah. I think um, with both, with both restaurant industry and, and retail, I'm, I think there's such a I mean, most positions are forward facing where you are, um, you're serving the guest right in front of you. And so it's not this, Hey, I'm a cog in, in a production line of one thing. I don't see a bigger purpose to what I'm doing. You see the purpose, like you were bringing food and beverage to that person that is hungry and thirsty. Um, so I think for, for younger people, it's easy to connect that this is why we're doing what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for people that are maybe questioning like, oh, this is just a job. I'm just making, you know, making ends meet. I would just encourage them the same way I do with the the busters and hostesses and um, people at the restaurant of like really dig into um, this might not be what you want to do for the rest of your life, but dig into the the why and dig into the how you're doing it. Just work hard and and have integrity and and showing up on time and and, you know being honest with your dealings and, and treating guests the way you would want to be treated when you go to a restaurant. And I mean, I always say, I think everyone should hopefully have worked in a restaurant at some point in their life. Cause it just gives you such perspective on, on a, how hard waiting tables and just the whole service industry is, but you just, you deal with people when you're out and about differently because mm-hmm. you have, you know, you remember those times of when you were, you know, bussing tables and taking gum off the bottom of a table or cleaning up kids crayons and mess under the table. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. As we start to wrap up our conversation today, Jeff, I wonder how your faith or your presence as a Christian has affected your experience personally in these industries in which you work and now lead. For instance, I wonder if there are any times you've encountered issues in which your faith maybe brought greater clarity and was helpful, or on the other hand, if your faith has ever caused friction for you in in one of these realms in which you work. Yeah, I think um, with the restaurant specifically, I mean, obviously, COVID is still a very fresh thing in all of our minds. I think, I think my faith really framed the way our team as a whole um, kind of went through that that time. I remember before, um, you know, pre pre pandemic, I would just be a little more anxious at the restaurant of mm-hmm. what a bad review would do, or if someone is angry, or what happens if you know the hot water heater went out and we had to close for a day and just real angsty about it. And I think we just, this forced stop this like, okay, this is the worst case scenario. This is my worst nightmare of the restaurant is empty and it's a Friday and just getting to that and being like, you know what? We're okay. Like I remember sitting, this was early on, you know, the week after kind of everything shut down and sitting in an empty restaurant. It's like on a Friday night and, uh, it was me, our executive chef, and our kitchen manager, who I mentioned early. So our executive chef is a big guy from El Salvador. Our kitchen manager is a big guy from Mexico. And I'm a big guy, and the three of us are all kind of teary-eyed in an empty restaurant. And it's like, okay, guys, we're going to be okay. Let's go. And and that early period of COVID when we were just doing takeout and we weren't sure what was going to happen, like those are some of my favorite memories because I, I feel like I was able to lead out of my faith of like no matter what, we're going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. And I think that hopefully, and I, I believe my staff would say that if like they picked up on that and they act in the same way. And so, um, I think without that, it would have been a really, uh, tough time of just like, I don't know what's going to happen, but just having this baseline of like, I know what's going to happen. I know ultimately I'm secure in my faith. And so I can operate even in the most trying times I can operate in a consistent place. Um, yeah. So I think that's kind of an area where, just without without my integration of faith, um, it would have been a lot more um, anxiety filled days, and I would have led from a place of that, and it would have not been a good thing. So, Jeff, I think practically speaking, I'm curious. Like, 
how did you guys survive COVID? Because financially, some restaurants couldn't make it. What what allowed you guys to make it? Were you able to do enough business through takeout to uh, keep the lights on? Did you have to make some drastic cuts in other areas? I'm I'm just curious. Yeah. How you got through it? Yeah, I think, um, and I'm saying the opposite today with real estate in the restaurant. But that was a time where my my business partner and I both really heavily leaned for our, for our own personal finances, leaned on, um, real estate. So we were able to operate the restaurant, not thinking about like, we basically said, okay, we're not getting paid through the restaurant. Let's pay everyone that wants to stick around. And so having those kind of multiple streams of income, uh, really helped where, you know, one was really high early in COVID and one was obviously low. And now Mm -hmm. it's like, Man, I'm really glad I have the restaurant right now because real estate's kind of a little slower in the last couple of months. So. Well, we've come full circle we've now. Come full circle. You have a portfolio you, yeah, yeah. career. Yes. And you have a portfolio career of things that are in these types of industries we talked about mm-hmm. that are pretty volatile mm-hmm. and there's maybe low barriers to entry. There's not a low barrier to entry to owning a restaurant necessarily, but the industries are are can be up and down. Yeah. And one of the wisdom principles, and I think this is a Proverbs wisdom principle that you actually practice is you spread out your risk a little bit. You don't have all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. And that allows you to have this vocation where you give yourself to several things at once and, and you get to be involved in several different industries and you do it in a sustainable way. I think one of the way, things that makes it sustainable for you is the intentional variety that you have cultivated an investment person might call it uh, diversification of mm-hmm. your portfolio. Yep. I think Jeff is really visionary because as opposed to Hunter, who was uh, indicating that craft fairs were traumatic in his <laughs> life earlier, I think uh, that craft fairs are really trending. So I think you're in on the front end <laughs> yeah. of the, something the important. The craft fair here, is like Jeff. the naked guy streaking across the end of Mark's gospel in, in your life. <laughs> you know, I've just been preaching this gospel and there's like, suddenly there's a naked man running away and you're like, what is that? That's kind of it, how the craft fair strikes me metaphorically yeah, in your portfolio sometimes career. Sometimes things should not be turned into a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> it is It is uh, very, very random. And like I said, we were joking before we started recording of just when I introduce, you know, when someone asks me what I do and I say I own a craft fair and I just get these puzzled looks of like, uh, what? You know, so there is, I mean, there really is a, like kind of how I mentioned with the restaurant of, you know, I don't like the automation piece. I mm-hmm. like the hospitality. I like the hands-on. I like the face-to-face. Really, like, the ethos behind the craft fair has that, too, of, like, we're the anti-Amazon. I mean, mm-hmm. people show up in person to go purchase something, and that the person they're buying it from made it with their own hands. Like, we are... I would say of all the craft, we're pretty high quality craft fair. Like we jury and we have to say yes or no on things and it has to be all handmade. And so I really do. At first when we bought it, I was like, I don't know what I'm getting into. And once we started thinking about, again, not the what, but the why, why we're doing it, I really got kind of excited about it. Like we are giving an avenue for, so each fair we have about 160 different vendors. So we're giving an avenue for 160 different makers to make something with their hands and present their art to people and present their product to people and people actually show up and there's this transaction, the same thing with the restaurant rather than, Mm -hmm. you know, just driving through a drive through and, you know, a robot serving you a meal, you sit down, you get served by someone, you're face to face with your, you know, with, with your guests or with the, with the people you're dining with and, and it just brings something different. So the same thing with the craft fair. So, so I've been sitting here making jokes. I don't know if that's drama. I think you'd like it. <laughs> I've been sitting here making jokes and you actually have a very intentional, thoughtful, um, <laughs> really inspiring rationale yeah. for the craft fair, yeah. which is why I love you, Jeff. This is, this is what I find every time I talk to you, I'm inspired. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That it, Thank you for sharing that. Yep. It is really insightful. And I wonder, Jeff, what um, you see as the necessity or benefit of Christian presence, a presence that's really rooted in faith in these different sectors of the economy. Yeah, I think um, I think the, the need for Christian, let's just call them small business owners, is... Um, one, bringing it back to uh, maybe away from bottom line profits and more to this is the why we do things and this Mm -hmm. is the how we do things. I think a lot of times 
um, in smaller businesses um, and big businesses, people can be just seen as just a means to an end, a cog in a wheel. And I think Christians are needed to, to be entrepreneurs, to be business owners so they can see our God given, you know, worth and image in each one of their employees and each one of their clients and each one of their, you know, whatever constituent you're dealing with and, and treat them as such versus just like, you know, well, this makes sense profit wise, or, you know, we could make, we could be more profitable at the craft fair if we just didn't have the actual fair, didn't rent out a space, but just mailed things to people and just take out those, you know, kind of those human elements and those, um, yeah. And same thing with, with the restaurant. I think people would be easy to say, we'll make more money on to go because we cut out overhead. We cut out people. We don't need servers if we go to go. And, and I think you lose kind of our, our God given cultural mandate to, to subdue the earth, to fill the earth, to, um, yeah, to grow God's kingdom here. And so I think when you view small business as kingdom minded, um, with a kingdom kingdom mindset, um, I think you put back in those, especially the people aspect of it and the relationship aspect of it. So, um, so I think it's highly important for, for, uh, there to be Christians in that, in that sector. Hmm. I want to loop back for our, our final question here to something you mentioned about the way that you were able to navigate COVID a question that we're weaving into each of these conversations is this question of non-anxious presence. So on the podcast a little while ago, Hunter and I discussed this book, A Non-Anxious Presence by Mark Sayers. And one point that he makes in the book that I've brought into each of these conversations is that leadership and influence are leveraged not so much through a particular position or title, but through a particular sort of presence, which he calls a non-anxious presence. And we've identified that we're living in an anxious age for many reasons, but there are specific moments too, like that of COVID, what you, the scenario that you shared about sitting in your restaurant in an empty restaurant due to factors beyond your control it was a time that could have been very anxiety producing for you. And the way that you were able to navigate it was different because of the sort of presence you were able to have. So our last question is just, can a non anxious, faithful, grounded presence be transformative in the workplace or in a specific sector of the marketplace? Yeah, I mean, I think that's going to be <clears throat> one of the biggest transformers in the, the marketplace right now is someone, because it is, we are in a highly anxious time right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's everyone, like within social media and the political scene and racial injustice and all these different, and COVID still, and it, we just have hit like fever pitch in the last two years. And so I think, again, back to how we dealt with COVID at the restaurant, I think me by the grace of God being able to say, okay, I'm going to be okay in this. Mm -hmm. That was like shocking to my staff around me. Like, wait, why aren't you freaking out? Or why aren't you saying how much you can't sleep at night? Or like where I just kind of had this peace that passes all understanding. Mm -hmm. um, because again, what the Lord has done in my own heart. And I think that was like revolutionary to to non-believers, they didn't understand. And, and so it was actually having them ask me like, can you, why are you acting like you're acting right now? You should be freaking out. And so I think if more and more Christians operate, cause even, I mean, Christian or non-Christian, it's an easy time to be anxious right now. Mm -hmm. And so I think as believers, because in the book he talks about, you can't be, you can't have a non-anxious presence without God's presence. And so mm -hmm. if as believers, we say our faith is secure, our hope is secure in the work you know, of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. And I'm going to operate out of that. It's going to be, um, it's going to turn heads in, in the marketplace. And so, um, hopefully that does spark more conversations of why are you not anxious right now? Cause you should be. And then you say, because mm -hmm. of Jesus and, mm -hmm. and hopefully that has kind of exponential, or I know that it will have exponential, um, results in, in, in the marketplace. In a lot of ways, you're just describing the doctrine of justification, 
which is our secure standing with God that puts us in relationship with Him. You're just describing the doctrine of justification worked out in practical terms. You're also describing the doctrine of the kingdom of God, that we belong to a kingdom that is eternal and that will never fade away. You're describing that just worked out in practical terms in someone's heart and mind. So thanks for doing that for us. And that's exactly what the Vision for Life podcast is about. (laughs) Jeff, we're so grateful for the work that you do, for your family, for your presence here at Fellowship and your leadership in our community. And we're really grateful that you took some time to talk with us today. Thanks for having me. If you have questions about today's episode or suggestions about what you'd like to hear us discuss on the podcast in the future, you can send all of that anytime to podcast at fellowshipdenver.org. Thanks for joining us on the Vision for Life podcast. Special thanks to Adam Englund for our theme music, to Jesse Cowan, our producer, and to Judd Connell, who provides transcription for these episodes. 